Howdy everybody in YouTube land. What we have here is an Apple external CD-ROM drive. The drive works fine as we speak, but let's see what model was it? It is a Apple CD 300 made in November of 1993. So this drive was working fine, like I said, and then I noticed the longer I was using it as I was moving the caddy in and out of this thing, you get that nice aroma of fish oil. So y'all know what that means. <laughs> so now it's getting it apart and see what we got going on inside. So I got the lid off. I don't really have the aroma coming from the power supply area as much but it is really strong oh man wow it's strong coming from this so clearly we're gonna have to get into that one first and see what we got going on all right now i got the lid of it off i just kind of sat it in there out of the way the aroma really hits you in the face as soon as you uh take that lid off so we uh, man so we know where our problem is. And man, that screws are overly really tight. Like it was just run in there with no regards or care. But yeah, this uh this thing's who putrid. Man, alright, let's see what we have. Actually, surprisingly, not that many, but oh, I tell you, it's bad. It smells really bad. So, we're looking at this tank farm over here. And then we're looking at these three down here. And there's one over here. And I can see the leads are all crustified, so they're, they're done. They're shot. Of course they are. I see some black ones, but those appear to be actual tantalum capacitors, unlike the other drive. So, up oh, except for these down here. Well, hold on. Nope, they're tantalums. Alright, well, I guess. Typical Sony laser pickup assembly. Oh, looks like it's voice coil actuated too. That's nice. Alright, well, I think it's time to get this board out and then uh, do something about it. So I got all those uh, nasty capacitors off there, and the, it's pretty bad. It was leaking pretty good. There's some corrosion. You can see some crap under the solder mask. So it's got to be washed. Now, I've got the solid ceramic tantalum-style capacitors I can use over here. I don't have any of those, so I have to put them electrolytics in there. And in this case, I can do that because this is just in the power supply and audio path. Because over here in the servo path, there's already tantalum capacitors in there, solid caps. And it's already been tuned up. So I don't have to touch anything over there. All I need to do is just replace the power supply decoupling caps and the audio capacitors over here. So, yeah, this one's going to be fun because this socket is right in the way. That's where the ROM goes, and I removed it. So... Yeah, I'm going to have to uh, navigate my way around that and clean this board up the best I possibly can. And, and it's this goo has got up in between the chips here. It's, it's pretty nasty. So, yeah, here we go. Alrighty then. So that is now being cleaned and dried. The next thing we got to do is we need to get to the other one that's down in there. Because there's our good old friends right down in there. You can see one of them's already corroded, so that audio board's got to come out and get cleaned. Ain't this fun? So after taking the two screws out of the side and then two screws in there, which are these four here, we can now get the board out. So at this point, it's time to pull these three capacitors out and clean up underneath them because you can see the nice brown crustiness, which would affect audio performance if you plugged the headphones or something in there and tried to listen to this, so they gotta go. Got all the caps off of this one, and yeah, it's leaky. Once again, I gotta 
put this through the cleaner and dry it out. All right, now that those boards are cleaning and drying, let's uh, move this out of the way so we don't lose these. You don't want those breaking. So we'll move that out of the way. Uh, anyways, let's take a look at the power supply. Let's do an inspection on it and figure out um, what we're going to need to do with that. Figure out what capacitors are in there. I'm sure they're going to need changed eventually. So looks like we got a couple of screws. Um, we just got to peel this tape, but we should be able to should be able to handle this no problem. Let's get this out of here. So to get this apart, this look, there's a little plastic sheet that's mounted right here. There's a hole where um, a little plastic plug pulls out of. Once you pull that out, you can pretty much lift this out, which will expose two screws here. And at that point, you can just get the power supply apart. But on first inspection, I'm not seeing any damage on the bottom of the board. And taking a quick inspection in here, I'm not seeing anything that's a telltale sign of leakage. I won't know until I get it out, but they're going anyways. They're going to be replaced regardless. All right, I got the power supply out. This is extremely similar in design of the other CD-ROM drive that I'm restoring. Um, very similar. It doesn't have the one microfarad 50 volt cap right here like it normally would. Uh, unless it's sandwiched in there somewhere, but I don't see it. It appears to use a multi-pin switcher controller IC. So I'm sure those are not available anymore. So if they go bad, you know, you're kind of screwed. So that's why I want to get ahead of this before it happens. I don't see any major signs of leakage anywhere. Matter of fact, the only capacitor that's showing any signs of leaking is this one right here. And you can't really tell, but on the positive side, it's got a slightly different, it's slightly discolored and it may not, it, it's just, it's just starting. So it's a good thing we got to this now. So we've got two, um, 10 volt thousand, actually, no, this is a 16,000. This is uh what is this? A uh, thousand at 10 volt, just like the other one. This is a 2200 at 10 volt. And this is a um, 1500 at 16. I know I don't have that one. I have these three, but I don't think I have that one. And I don't have this one either. So what I like to do with these is I take my fingernail and I push to see, to make sure, because these will look bubbled, but that doesn't mean anything. So you push the plastic down and then just kind of feel see if they're flat and this one is and this that one's probably fine and i don't see any signs of leaking coming from it either but i'll check it to make sure so yeah we are uh we are to the point to where we can get a cap list together um and start recapping this thing really and oh one more thing to note this this power supply let's see it's made by mitsumi japan this tape is still sticky. I, I had a hard time peeling it up to get the wires out from underneath it. So all these years later, the adhesive is still good on the tape. Imagine that. While I have the desoldering iron warming up, one thing to note and what I like to do with a lot of these power supply units or boards like this, is if I'm going in here to recap the capacitors or change a component if something fails, whatever, I like to take a quick inspection of all the solder joints and just look for things that are suspicious that could be touched up or whatever. Um, just out of general rule of thumb, I always resolder the transformer pins and I want to resolder these controller pins here because I, I really don't, don't want a failure to occur in here through something that's mechanical. I'd rather have, if something's going to fail, I'd rather it be an electrical fault than a mechanical fault causing an electrical fault. So we'll just take care of that. You might as well when it's all the way out just to make life a lot easier going forward into the future. So I have the four capacitors pulled out and one of these, maybe two of these, just started to smell like that fish oil smell. And it's not fish oil, it's some special chemical. I forget exactly what it is. Uh, there was a guy I was talking with on Discord who was telling me exactly what the composition is i don't know i'm not a capacitor engineer so i couldn't tell you but um anyways so the 1500 that's here 
And in that 1,000 that I suspected over here were the two that smelled kind of fishy when I heated the pins. I don't see any evidence on the board other than that, but that's not cap goo. That's, that's, that's some kind of clear coat that they put on these boards, and it's everywhere. Um, so, and the same thing over here. I can wipe that off, wipe that off. There's, it, there's nothing there. It's, it's dry. But you can see clearly, when I was heating this one up, you can't smell it unless we have smell vision But you can kind of see, and the phone might compensate for it, but you see the terminals at the base where the rubber plug is. It's kind of starting to turn green a little bit. It's definitely done. It's, it's literally just starting to leak. And yeah, you can kind of see where the pin comes out where uh, it's a little bit wet where the pins coming out so yeah this this it, it's it's they're just going they're just starting to leak so any of you watching this video if you have any of these drives kicking around in your collection please pull them apart and recap them i mean these are already bad but these are just starting to go bad sure you can get 5 volt 12 volt power supplies all day long you could you could take one of them cheap you know Vantech bricks or something like that that comes with an external SATA to USB and throw that in there just rig it in sure it's hidden away it's rigged in but why wouldn't you want to use the original power supply I mean it's already in there might as well fix it and use it if you can so just just I, I can't reiterate enough get the capacitors out of here and get them replaced I know there's a lot of people I watch on YouTube that um don't like shotgun capacitor replacements and don't get me wrong i don't want to argue against that because there's a time and place for things like that so you know this stuff was made during a very critical point in time where it's it's gonna it's gonna fail okay they're gonna start leaking there's no way around it all electronics made from about the mid to late 80s to almost the mid 90s are all leaking uh, I've noticed a, a point from the mid 90s to about 98, 99. I haven't seen those capacitors bad yet. Doesn't mean they aren't bad from environmental abuse, like standing right next to a heat sink that gets hot and then they start leaking or they dry out or whatever. That's a completely different story. That's, you know, but this is in that niche period where, you know, in general, they're going to be bad. And then everything seems to be okay until you get to about 2000. And then it goes to hell again. The capacitor plague and it's a whole different set of circumstances that i won't get into and i'm sure you can find many articles on wikipedia and stuff like that and other youtube videos but uh, yeah that's a whole different but there's a small narrow range in between the two plague eras that everything's all right and then up the early 80s through before they seem to have very solid capacitors too not everything was affected obviously um you know so there's niche there's there's very niche situations to where like a crt tv or something like that that was made in 91 92 you might have one capacitor that's bad two capacitors that's bad that are maybe common fault capacitors or other capacitors that are sat next to a heat sink or something like that and that's it you replace those two it works great and doesn't go bad for another 10 15 years whatever but those that's not the norm anymore that's just the niche this this here is the norm this is starting to become it's like it's almost like the collectors in the 90s and early 2000s grabbing 40s and 50s and 60s radios and TVs knowing they got to change out every single one of those wax paper capacitors because they're guaranteed they're all going to be bad and if not they will be the same situation here and you know I was talking to a friend of mine uh the other day and he made a good a good comment that it really stuck with me stuck with me for a while and made me think of it a different way because um, I, I never thought of this and it's basically like this anybody that's in the IT industry you know what's the meme thing that you normally do what's the meme turn it off and back on again did you reboot it did you turn it off and back on again well in the electronics world guess what he said that well have you changed the capacitors yet have you checked the capacitors yet no well go check the capacitors he's not wrong I mean yeah, that one stuck with me. So that's the way it is with this stuff now. I mean, 
gotta check the capacitors. They're, they're gonna be leaking and they're gonna look like that, especially if they're surface mount guys. A lot of the Sony gear from the late 80s, a lot, all that stuff, you know? They were, the only exception to the rule are some of these through hole capacitors that are small signal caps that don't have a lot of current, ripple current flowing through them. They hold up. They never have a problem. Um, you know, axial leaded capacitors that are on a digital board, I've never seen ones go bad yet as far as small ones that don't have current flowing through them. When you start getting into filter caps or caps that have voltage applied to it all the time, current ripple current through it, they're leaking. I've noticed that even axial leaded, like for example, the Macintosh Portable, they have a couple of axial leaded capacitors in there. They're leaking. And normally because, well, that's part of the filter circuit for one of the rails, the negative 5 volts or the 12 volts. Of course they're leaking. Same thing with the through-hole ones like this. They're leaking because they're in the power supply circuitry. There's ripple current applying, applied across them. Small signal ones, I don't... Small signal through-holes, dip, well, depending on the brand. I don't want to stick my foot in my mouth, but my experience is the small signal through-hole stuff I haven't seen leaking yet. That doesn't necessarily mean they don't go bad or go open because there's many, many, many cases out there from other people where, that's, where that has happened. So I don't want to give anybody the wrong impression, but my personal self, I have not seen it yet. Doesn't mean I'm not going to, I just haven't seen it. Now, power supply filters and decoupling caps, sure. I see them bad all the time. It's just, it is what it is. So I am going to go ahead and get the capacitors together. My rant is over. I had to rant. I'm going to get the capacitors together and get this power supply put back together and see what happens. I decided just for rule of thumb, just to make sure everything's okay. I pulled out the main filter cap, um, inspected it, checked it for leakage. I don't see anything. Ran it through my tester, which is over there in that box. Um, there, it's low ESR and the capacitance is fairly dead on. So that capacitor is good. I'm just going to leave it be. Sure, I could replace it. If this was a customer's, I would replace it. I wouldn't question it. But since this is mine and I don't use it that much, I'm just going to leave it be. I don't care enough. Um, also, this had a 2200 and a 1500. Well, I have all of my parts over here. I have three 2200 microfarads left over. So I'm just going to put a 2200 microfarad in place of that. Now, before you start flaming me, please note, do not just substitute random value parts in places if you don't know what you're doing you really need to understand the operation and design of these switching power supplies before you make a decision like that in my case i do i understand how this works and i understand what part of the circuit that's in and it also helps that i just saw another one of these power supplies that has a slightly higher current handling capability has a 2200 sitting here this one only has a 1500 capacitor there and then this capa this power supply is rated for a slightly less current output capability on one of the rails so if i put a 2200 in there does that mean that the power supply can handle a higher current cap capability well that depends because it depends on the transistor it depends on that it depends on the the uh value of this you know there's a lot of similarity or differences and similarities there so you're not necessarily going to gain more current out of it but you'll gain a little bit better filtering you don't want to go too big on this and you don't you definitely do not want to go undervalue so if you had a 1500 there and you only had a 1000 on hand don't do that if you have a 1500 on there but you want to if you have an 1800 on hand or a 2200 on hand you can safely do that most of the time, but you really got to understand the circuit and what part it's in. In this case, it's just a ripple filter, the primary ripple filter, before it goes through the filter choke inductor and in the main one out here. So you have capacitor, inductor, capacitor. That's what you call a pi filter circuit. It's called a pi network. There's one on the 5 volt rail and there's one on the 12 volt rail. Well, this is the 12 volt rail, this is the 5 volt rail, but still there's a pi network there and a pi network there and it helps keep the current you know, spikes suppressed. This helps with current mode spikes, this helps with voltage mode spikes. So in the case of the design of this power supply, I can safely put a slightly larger capacitor in here and it's going to work fine. But again, your mileage may vary 
and just don't blindly do it. If you have this same drive with this same power supply, well, it's safe to do so. But if you have a different setup, please check everything. And if you're not sure, just put the original one back in with the right value. Only do it if you know what you're doing. And that's the disclaimer. Alrighty then, I got the new capacitors installed. I resoldered my critical solder joints. I got um, these are slightly taller because they're 25 volt capacitors. But before you go and just put taller caps in, make sure you have the clearance to do that. And in my case, I do, so I'm not worried about it. Um, without further ado, let's go ahead and get this thing back together. All right, well, power supply's back in there. It's all mounted down. Just put those two screws back in. And I was even able to peel up the tape and get it all stuck back down. But all right, well, I'm just waiting for the circuit boards to dry, and we're going to go ahead and start recapping and getting the main CD ROM drive done. All right, the board's dry, and we've got some damage to the circuit board that we can plainly see. Uh, for example, there's two vias right here that look kind of dingy. And if I do the good old flashlight trick that I've shown multiple times, turn on the flashlight and get the board ready and just kind of put it right there. And then we'll take a look. And then if you look very closely, the copper is pretty much gone on those vias. See if I can get a better focus. Yeah, it's it's pretty much gone. So those vias can't be trusted. I'm surprised this thing worked at all. So what I'm gonna have to do, if I follow it on the other, other side, they come out through here and then they go to this resistor. So what I'm probably gonna do here is take a patch wire from this capacitor, this point there, because there's the input filter, filter choke, comes through into the capacitor to this, these two vias and it comes out the other side and goes to the resistor. So I want to make a jumper wire that goes from here to here. So I got to fix that for sure. And then I'm going to inspect everything over there because there's four vias that come through the ground, ground plane that look pretty dingy as well. So I want to check all of that stuff. Alrighty then. Recap is complete. I got all new aluminum polymer capacitors on the audio board and the main board. And then I've got the ceramic capacitors as my filter caps for the 47 microfarads i got 210 microfarads in there for the filter caps i've also got even though it's still connected i didn't want to take any chances i made a patch wire trying to avoid the vias from here up to the resistor so in theory everything should work and it worked before it just you know it was only a matter of time before it was not going to so well, now, it's either now or never. Let's get it back together and see what the hell. I'm going to go for broke. I'm going to put it all the way together. And then we're going to go for broke and see if it works. Well, that was painful to reassemble because they don't give you much length on these ribbon cables. And they're extremely delicate. So you're wiggling things around and trying to get it in there. And it's real easy to tear one of those. And if you tear one of these, it, you might as well throw it in the garbage. It's pretty much came over. So you got to be super careful. Anyways, I got the face on, got the connector in, I got all things in there now. So really at this point, it's uh, getting the cover on, which is right here. I think this goes on, yep, goes on just like that. So it's just a matter of getting that lined up properly. And it's it kind of sits in a weird yeah, just kind of, anyways, I got to need both hands to do this. I'm going to get this back together. Alrighty then. So I pretty much just have it sitting in here right now. I got all the cables plugged in. So at this point, I think I'm going to go ahead and plug the power into it, which is right here. Move that on my way, put power into it. It's either going to blow up or it's not. No explosions don't have any lights I don't remember if I was supposed to have lights or not so what I'm gonna do is put this in and see nope I've got nothing okay oh my power cords crap 
Ah, there we go. North. Huh. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. Let's try this. Well, that failed. Well, it must be a timing thing that I've messed up in the mechanism somewhere. Okay. Whoop, there it goes. And green ready light, so it picked it right up. Yeah, see. I'm wondering if there's a belt. I hear the motor running. Well, that sucks. Okay. Nope, it's screwed. So, well, you fix one thing and you break another. Hey, that's just how it goes sometimes. So I'm trying to figure out how this mechanism works, and I think I got it right away. Um, these gears here, they spin. Right now, they're locked into place. Just a minute ago, they were free spinning. There's a gear in there that couples with this worm gear that drives these. Well, there's a lever here that moves that gear in and out of the mesh. And that lever... When it when you push it this way, it pulls it away so you can spin those gears freely. When it, they're spring loaded, so it comes back. But notice when I move it out of the way, it's just returning very slowly. It's one, it's sticking. So that's all that is. It's dried up grease, just like the floppy drives and stuff like that. I gotta get in there and relubricate some of this stuff, and I guarantee it'll work fine after that. And then I gotta fight with all those cables again. Ah. All right, so I took a little bit of my favorite zoom spout oil. I was able to drop a little bit into this pivot point here, work it, and then if I move it, it snaps right back. That's what it's supposed to do. So I'm gonna go ahead and add a little bit of oil to some of these other points. I'll probably put a little bit on these slide gears because, you know, it's all drying up. So I'm gonna do that and then I, it, it should work fine now. All right, this time I got that oil and I lubricated some other key points. Uh, I didn't put the cables back in because this time I'm cautiously optimistic. So let's get this in here and turn it on. It looks like it's spinning up the disc again. Should go green. It does. So it detected the disc. Will it eject? Oh, uh, you sucker. I may not have got that right. Well then, um, huh. I put the face back on with the disc loaded. Yeah, it's, yeah, I got to check. Dang it. This thing's a pain. All right, I'm tired of screwing around. <clears throat> Figuring out how this caddy ding works. It looks like when you go to push it in, it trips. And then it causes that little door to fall down. So I'm trying to figure out how, if you push that down. Okay, so, huh. Well, let me just leave this face off and see if it'll eject. Yes, it does. Now, will it accept it? Okay, so this is clearly a door problem, this thing. The ejection system's fixed. Now, I need to figure out how that works. All right, so let me get the disc out. And then what we're gonna do, oh, this is, I'm gonna try to break the cable. There we go. All right, so now with this release, now let me put it back together. All right, one important thing to note, after fiddling around with it a little bit, there's a little metal catch 
and this thing has to be the plastic has to be below that catch when the when the disc is loaded so now in theory it should work and there it goes that's the key point that metal lever has to be above the plastic lever or it won't it, it won't allow the door to open to eject so now now it's working yes finally and this is how you learn your mistakes I didn't pay attention to that when I took this face off so that's why it didn't work properly there you go alright now we can finally conclude this video uh, at this point the disc the drive is working now the drive worked before but it just smelled really bad so yeah it's it's okay now so I think we, I mean, I don't need to make a video of myself reassembling this and all that craziness. So I think what we're going to do is just go ahead and put this in one more time. And then watch that light turn green. It did, so it's, it's detected the table of contents and it's a valid CD. And we're going to go ahead and end it right here. So... If you have a comment, please feel free to leave one. Otherwise, thank you for watching, and until next time.